All right. We're on a super tight schedule here. Very, very, very precise. Very precise. No, I'm, 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 I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> uh, in this talk, we'll be talking about the generalization of the rig that we've seen in the previous talk to uh, model expenses of the user of surfaces. So just let, let me just be clear here. By model space, I mean model space of endpoints on Riemann spheres, G0. So let me remind you what, what that is. So I will denote it with the symbol <coughs> MOF. F O stands for G0 and N for the number of punctures. And that modular space is the configuration space of F points on CP1 or a sphere, all shifted by the redundancy group, which in this case is a SOC <coughs> conformal group. So if I denote positions of the points by, Z, by ZI and so on, we can use this redundancy uh, in our description to fix three points by convention the first, second, last, and the last one to zero, one, and infinity. Okay, that's just a choice for convenience. And in this case, uh, if we do this, then this is described by positions of the remaining points, starting with z2 and ending on z and minus 2. Uh, each of them belongs to a, its own sphere, and then we raise it to the minus power. And from this space, we'll remove configurations in which multiple, uh, one or, or, sorry, two or more points combined. Okay, so we remove These configurations when any zi is equal to any zj or i in general state. Okay, so some examples. Right at the bat, we have that n equals 4. <coughs> in this case, m of 4 is, well, let me notice that this is always an n minus 3 complex dimensional space. In this case, it has one complex dimension. So the sphere, CP1, associated to, to our original. Uh, puncture V2, which is the only one that we can move in this case, and from there we remove 0, 1, and infinity. Okay, so that's exactly what we've been studying before. It's a single surface with three points removed. Okay, so an example. <coughs> or n equals 5. So the simple generalization of that would be L5 is equal to the space which is CP1 squared minus some remote type plates. So, in particular, we remove all the places where the Z2 can collide. This is parameterized with Z2 and Z3. And then we move the uh, points where Z2 collides with any of the 0, 1, infinity, like this for the Z3, as well as the diagonal with Z2 collides with Z3. But as you might notice here, this is a two complex dimensional space, but this black group has two real dimensions. So let me just draw it, draw the real slice of the space. So it will be parameterized by the real direction of Z2 and real direction of Z3. Okay? And the, there's like points of infinity or <coughs> So from this space, we remove uh, places where Z2 can be either 0, 1, infinity. So it would be, we remove this line, which is 0. We remove a line at 1. And let me include the infinity like that, so we also remove this line. Similarly, here for Z3, 0, 1, infinity. And at the last one, we remove the collision of point Z2 and Z3. So more generally, these kind of structures are called hyperplane arrangements. <coughs> That's one example. And there will be a lot of interesting combinatorial structures, most of which will sort of 
gloss over for the purposes of this talk, but they can be studied. <coughs> There's actually also an interesting combinatorial relation to uh, cluster algebra of so type A, and that's something that you will hear more about in tomorrow's lectures. Okay, so what's the interpretation of, of each point here? So that's some space. We just selected the real slice of the space. So it's a point here corresponds to a sphere. Where let, let me say that, well, maybe instead of a sphere, because it's easier to travel, let me draw it as a complex plane. Okay. And that's a complex plane in which we fix the points 0, 1, and infinity. And a given point here is when uh, z2 is between 0 and 1, so it's somewhere here, z2. And likewise, z3 is between 0 and 1, so it's either here or here. Uh, but because it's above this inequality of z2, being equal to z3, it lands here. So that specific point corresponds to this configuration of, of punctures on a boundary, um, uh, on, a, on a real slice of, of this plane. Or you can think of it as a line on a circle. I think it comes with some with some specific um, orientation. So in particular, this point zero was punctual Z1. One was the, where we fixed the point, and similarly Z5 was fixed at infinity. And that tells us that associated to this specific uh, triangle, which we will call a chamber, chamber is any connected component of this real part of the complex space. And as I've said, this we can label it by permutation of points. One, two, three, four, five in this case. Okay, which is the permutation uh, that any point here represents on the, on the original. <coughs> okay, then it's easy to try, uh, try to assign permutations to other chambers because when you go from here to here, so let's say you want to cross this way, all that happens is that Z2 and Z3 exchange, and that means that associated to this, you have the uh, chamber, you have permutation 1, 3, 2, 4, 5, and so on and so on. For example, here, uh, this was Z4 and Z2 exchange positions, so this would be 1, 3, 4, 2, 5, and you can fill in the rest. Now we can talk about singularities of this space a little bit more. Let's actually revisit what happened here. In this case, the modal space was a surface itself, with 0, 1, infinity. And what could have happened at each point on this modal space, like so, is a sphere with that specific insertion of the punctures, so it would be 0, 1, infinity, and z to the sphere. And we can ask what happens when that puncture coincides with any other one. Okay, for example, this is close to that. What it corresponds to on the modal space is that this specific puncture uh, approaches that one at a pitch. Okay, good. So equivalently, we can think of it as there's a procedure of the blow up which allows you to think of this space as by sort of conformal deformation as sort of two Riemann surfaces, two Riemann spheres, in which Z1, Z2, and in this case, Z2 and Z3 are on one side, and Z4 and Z1 on the, on the remainder. Okay. For our purposes, we can label this kind of degenerations by finite diagrams. Okay, so associated to, to this degeneration, there's a Feynman diagram of this type, which I would call T channel four. So the degeneration of this, whether it's uh, two, three, four, or one. Okay. When the any puncture uh, collides to this with this point. And that's in fact why we've seen T channel poles to this um, in the previous lecture. Similarly associated to this guy, there's a <coughs> S channel pole. So when you do it before, 
because this is where one and two collides uh, together. And likewise, the remaining part, the remaining similarity is the U charge. Okay, so then you can ask, well, what happens here in this uh, simple generalization? And what happens here is that, once again, if you, if you start approaching um, this similarity here, which is where Z3 coincides with Z4, this boundary corresponds to what configurations in which which roughly contributes to these um, to these configurations. Okay, so um, associated with this this specific similarity, we'll have a Feynman diagram uh, of this form. So let's do two more examples of this. For example, here, Z2 is colliding with Z1. Okay? Z2 is 1. So here we we'll have a Feynman diagram which is looking like that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then you can ask, well, what happens in this maximal? Um, so if you, if you go lower in the dimension of the singularity, so that point, for example, is where. Uh, both this and that generation, the generation at the same time. So you would call it this. Okay, so both one to collide, which means that this propagator emerges, and also three four collide, so this one emerges. And that's a general structure. If you consider boundary the boundary divisor of MOM. Which is which is this? Um, we, these were examples of the boundary divisors. This corresponds to some Feynman diagram the generation. And in particular, vertices. Vertices of the boundary divisor. So by vertices, I mean the ones that were maximally degenerated. This corresponds to configurations in which the Feynman diagram is the maximal number of propagators, or equivalent, or equivalently, trivalent, trivalent trees. Okay. Very good. That was more of an observation. Because there is problems with the description. Okay? There's these special points, which are called exceptional divisors, like here, <coughs> where both uh, where three points coll collide at the same time. So in this case, here, we have a singularity when z2 and z1 go into each other. <coughs> z3 with z1, and also the z2 with z3. And that's something that you need to take care of, you need to blow up <coughs> the singularity, and then that's uh, um, the later part of the stuff will be fine. Okay, that's as much as what I want to say about the geometry. Any questions? to introduce um, um, cycles of this moment space. The so cycle are now, uh, since the space is <coughs> n minus 3 complex dimensional, cycles will be always n minus 3 real dimensional. And examples of that are these objects, D of alpha, where alpha is a permutation of n labels. Okay, so then if you consider that D is defined as Z of alpha 1 smaller than Z of alpha 2 at the top until we go to the last function and then you still find the value. And you want the value because really things are defined on a 
cyclic thing on the circle. Okay, so what are some examples? Well, this specific chamber here, D of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, is exactly of this. Okay, so let me actually maybe let me spell out what it looks like. So this guy is Z1, smaller than Z2, but Z1 is fixed to 0. Z2, Z3, 1, infinity. Okay, so it's bounded by this inequality, which is this one to the right, bounded by this inequality, which is this one to the bottom, and by this one, which is this hyperplane in that direction, and that specifies this, this triangle. Okay, so these are valid objects, which are um, elements of n minus 3, n minus 4 homology on MON with Z coefficients. Okay. So then let me introduce these objects, which we typically call our inner <coughs> forms. And they are defined as follows. So similarly, let me introduce some permutation alpha and then consider the following <coughs> combination in which in the denominator I take the differences between positions of the uh, factors in this cyclic, specific cyclic order. And then in the numerator, I'm going to take and in volume form on the top holomorphic form on the model space, which is typically the data matrix. I will, in fact, let me spell out what this is just for completeness. So, since this combination will appear later on, let me just call it DU, some measure form of N. Actually, in specific, specific terms, what it means to mod out our SFPC, actually in SFPC, means that this would be, we can show that what I'm going to write is the correct combination. Okay. So we integrate over our n minus three factors, and then we multiply by this combination. We can show that that's independent of which factors you actually fixed and where. And where. Okay, so these, these objects are n minus three forms. So they are elements of n minus third homology group of n one with z coefficients. And then you can ask how many are actually linearly independent. We don't have to do this combination ourselves. It was done um, 50 years ago. All it takes is to compute the Poincare orthogonal of this space. As we did before, <coughs> so it's just a simple representation. Poincare orthogonal of L1, labeled by this auxiliary variable T, turns out to be. Is, is it compactified? So this is uh, cohomology in uh, kind of open part, right? And you're right. Exactly. It's not, it's without compactifying. And it's, this is uh, OLC. We'll get a different uh, characteristic. A different uh, comparable one of Let's 
put out a couple of first terms in this. So this will be the empty numbers that we've seen before. Okay, so the zero is just the biggest term, which is one. And what does it tell us? Well, it just tells us that our space is, is far connected. There's only one component. Well, then you can then you can ask well, what's B1. And B1 would be just the sum of the you just extract the linear term. So it would be sum of this k plus one from Q to Q. And that turns out to be one half of n times n minus three. Okay? And that's um, that will be important later on because this is the dimension of of the fundamental group of a planet, which, which well, uh, H1 is the abelianization of the fundamental group, and that's why the, the dimensions have to match. Okay, and then you can keep going. And then the other interesting part, which will be important for us, is N minus 3, asking basically what the dimension of this group and this group. Okay. So all you do is just extract the top component. So we multiply these numbers, k plus 1, from 1 to n minus 3. Okay. So you get 1 times 2 up to n minus 2, and that gives you n minus 2 to the third. So that's the number of independent both these forms, sorry, both these cycles and these forms over the Z. Very good. So as a curiosity for later on, let me also compute the other characteristic, I of n, which is now we can compute it by evaluating the functor polynomial of M O N at minus one, because that gives us the alternative sum. And each term now will be um, just minus k. Okay? So it's a minus one times minus two, dot the dot, until you reach n minus three, so you just put it out. <coughs> until you reach three minus one. Okay, and that's just concisely written as minus one is power times n minus three. Okay, so just keep this in mind and we'll use it later on. Any questions? of what we've seen before, everything will be almost identical. You can show that M O N is so called, I mean, it's a spherical. And what this means is that this, this would sometimes be called, sometimes called M O N with this property k by one, just for reference. This means that the fundamental group Surfaces here. So let's say this is the one where Z1 collides with Zj, Zi with Zj. And then we can 
consider elements of this group, which are just loops around the corresponding CVR. So this is what I would call gamma of the IJ. Okay. And what this means? Well, it just means that this point at the beginning is some configuration configuration of functors. In particular, there's some zi zj here. And this point at the end, after you cross the loop, so right here, here is, the, is the exact same configuration. The same writers. But if you track history of what happened, let's say you introduce some time and you want to study what happens in that time, what happens is that zi goes around zj. So you will do something like this. Okay? So here, from here to here, the time is. You see that from uh, basically what this fundamental group describes is how different functors can braid around each other as the as we evolve the, the Riemann surface. And that's that's the reason for which phi of M1 is an example of what we would call a pure braiding group. In this case of n minus three strands. These are two examples with three of the fixed. And three of the fixed ones are the ones a zero one in the, so they cannot hold in this particular representation. Not three of them are fixed, but So zero, zero, one, and yes. infinity cannot move, but all the other ones. In this case, they don't. But if you do, if you go on some adventure, you can get around your modal space. All the other ones. <coughs> okay. So now we know what the drill is. What we do is we want to consider representations of such groups, and that begins with introducing a potential. exponentiate this potential, and that means that there has to be some dimensional full constant here, which I will call alpha prime, because that's what we quick constantly found in string theory. Okay. So then, with this potential, we know what is known. We introduce a lot of system. specific W, and it's simply given by uh, mapping any path to the same as we've seen before. Very good. There's one interesting constraint that this gives us. <coughs> so, um, I will assume that moment, external momenta satisfy momentum. Z and 
and instead we fix it at some finite value. And in this case, this the the path in which we fix some uh, puncture z i, and then we encircle it around infinity. Now infinity is not a special point, so that means that such a path can be always contracted to the point. Okay, so this means that this is contractible. <coughs> This gives us a constraint because we knew that all contractible paths have to be uh, have to have one, and in this case we have an exponential of well, this integral over function z i going around infinity to be w for this specific d w. So the point is that this, this potential has some poles at uh, d of that potential has some poles at infinity, and exactly n of them. Okay, so we have exponential of minus 4 pi i, which is the discontinuity, of pi with a 1x. which is this condition, we can translate this to just a condition for the p squared, which is exponential of 4 pi i uh, alpha prime p i squared. Okay? And the, the constraint is that it, it, since it was a contractible path, it has to be 1. And that tells us that the mass spectrum Okay, this has to be discrimination. Uh, so, um, mass squared of one particle, which is defined as minus p i squared. Do you mean the sum is j less than i? There. I'm worried about factor two. Yes. That sum. Yeah. Uh, No, so there is a two, is it? Yeah. And there will be two pi i if you if this is correct. <coughs> yeah, there's an extra two. Okay. So if, it, if you wanted to do like j is for the i or something like this. Well that's what you have before. Well, that would be because there's a there's a Okay. So it was confusing to call this i because it's not the same as it is there. So if this was a k. Uh, like this, yeah. then the, the zk minus something appears exactly n minus 1 times here. Mm -hmm. That's why okay. we will not overcome it. <coughs> okay, but this constraint basically tells us that this combination, the mass square, has to be half in half integer multiple of one or half okay. And later on, we'll exploit this, so that's what happens in string theory. And if we, if we set things to be massless, so if, then these combinations of 2 pi i to j will often just call s and j, which are minus n variants. Just a short term notation. Okay. Any other questions? So let's continue, then we can introduce. As before, twisted homologies and cohomologies, HK on MON, twisted by this potential, 
and then HK properties in this thing define this before. <coughs> so these are only non matching in middle degree. Meaning that only the case k is equal to n minus 3 is non trivial which is the generalization of the results that we had before, and that's true if kinematics is better. for this guy, and likewise for the other guy. Okay. These two things are equal and equal to the uh, other characteristic of the sign, which is an Perfect. vertex operators on the bound to the disk in some permutation alpha. And then we free to choose the branch of um, omega that we want, of yeah. oh, W that we want, and we will choose it to be this, this specific combination. is always positive on this division cycle. Okay. So that almost gives us what we know a lot from physics. We only have to choose some proper representative of this um, cohomology class. But we have to choose some cohomology class. And this is what a phi class of gauge. Okay, so this is some cohomology class. I, I restrained myself from commenting earlier when you wrote the Tarteta factor, but the, the ordering of the of IJ is swapped here. Um, this is presumably the one you want, right? The, the ordering is was correct in both cases. Here we want it in that way because um, things are ordered like that. And I wanted to require that this is always positive. Yeah. So phi J is larger. Uh, so, Z, so when you wrote Park Taylor, you had a minus one to the n relative to it, but you got it reversed. You had one minus two and two minus three. Yeah, exactly. That's that's. I mean, that's in just notation, but that's the notation that I wanted to use. Okay. You did one. Okay. It's actually conventional. So. I know. Yeah, I know it's conventional. Okay. Okay. Here, also conventional because you want essentially this evaluated this integration domain. You want it to be equal to the this combination with absolute values. Okay, was there a reason for, for choosing the other convention for part table? Uh, yes. I mean, th th there was no other reason than it's a convention. Okay. But, but here there's more clearly like a reason for choosing that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in that sense, there was no like a priori reason. Okay. And as you're saying, it's just the same overall side. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, very good. So 
So we choose our um, cycle and its coefficient in this specific way. And now we specify some cohomology class. And you might wonder, well, where are we going to find it? And the answer, the answer is actually there. Uh, so I define this, this object called phi plus gauge for a given number of particles n. And then I just put it there for later reference. It looks like uh, this Grassmann integral or Grassmann variables. Uh, sorry. Of this Grassmann variables theta and theta theta. Then we choose some arbitrary k and l. And then we have this exponential. So if you're a physicist, this exponential corresponds to basically doing uh, all the OPE contractions. So that result is essentially taken from the book of Green Schwartz and Okay, so if you plug in this specific choice and that choice from over there, this computes you uh, open string attributes. And just to be more specific, in, uh, in, in, any, in, in any super string theory, we have external masters. there exists a cohomology class, which we actually know how to build, uh, for any type of string theory. And uh, the nice thing is that the code formalism stays the same. The only thing that changes is that the, uh, how you specify this, this file. OK, similarly. <coughs> Does that expression on the board have target space fermions built in as well? Or is that just for the target space gauge sector? Yeah, so that specific formula is for external masses bosons. Mm -hmm. It's for supersymmetric theory, so that would be in principle in the middle. Um, um, yeah. So there would be a different formula for the zone spring. That's what you have to say. I just want one thing. You have complex disease, but so that looks like closed string. You say it's open string? Yeah. Or is it going to complex disease? Yes. So what we've done here, so, um, so typically what, what we have in string theory is that we consider upper half plane and insert the functions here on the boundary of the upper half plane. And that's why they would agree. What we've done here instead is to integrate over a middle dimensional cycle, which lies in the <coughs> real part of the moduli space. And that space, this integral coincides with the original, so the more traditional description that you would find in the book. But, but, but what happens for hydraulic string? Let me, let me get to close rings now. Good. So now let me consider integrals of a different moduli space. And then, as before, where to put this function, and then insert some two homology classes, one holomorphic and the other antihomorphic. So one example of that is that we only have this some um, legroom to uh, choose these things because the rest is, is fully um, fixed. So that first part here, by the way, it's to ZI and ZK. So here it doesn't matter in which way you do it because uh, we take a mod, mod square. And then let's say you start inserting some homology classes. 
Let, let me just take the same ones or, uh, as before. And the only thing that I mean here by the tilde is that the tilde means replace polarization vectors with polarization vectors tilde. <coughs> okay. And this object, so let me, again, let me introduce, introduce the notation. So in this case, that would, that would be um, the ones with, uh, with super symmetries on both sides. If you wanted to do things uh, in an operatic way, you would have to start with certain different cohomology classes, and we know what they are. Although I'm not going to expand them out here. Okay, great. So what, what can we do? What can we learn from this? Well, one, one thing that we can learn is that we can start inserting a resolution of identity. And then with the choice of basis, what we obtain is simply this kind of projection formula. Which expresses our original closed string amplitude. combination of open string and open string amplitudes weighted by this matrix, intersection matrix. And this kind of formula is common as uh, Kawhi and Kawhi. Where these where these uh, numbers come from. Very good. So so let me just comment that what these what these um, what these Plan 
supposed to do some completion of this, but because it's, uh, I don't have enough time, <coughs> let me just sketch these words. So remember, <coughs> we had our um, modelized frames, which was looking like a five point, like this. And it's five. We have these hyperplanes. And there was a real Z2, real of Z3. And I mentioned that there's a problem here, speed diagonal. And I mentioned there's a problem here, that you go off the surface. If you actually do it, what this corresponds to is locally sort of introducing this surface that corresponds to um, collision of three points, like that. And you can do it locally around each dangerous divisor. Then what you discover, so that's roughly speaking like a compactification of the original uh, in the Dilemma process. Okay, so then what you discover is that D of 1 to 3 5, which was our original chamber, is not a triangle. It's in fact a pentagon. Okay? In fact, if you look at this picture, you would you find that all of them are pentagons. And these pentagons are not any random pentagons. There are examples of so called um, associated. Okay. So, roughly speaking, boundaries of this associated graph correspond to the generations of some trigger and traps. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'm expecting that the will tell you more about it later on. Okay. So what the interpretation of what we are computing here, this matrix, whose inverse uh, and this relation, is that we're computing intersection numbers. So you might complain that in order to access this kind of um, structure or computer intersection numbers, you need to blow up the surfaces and start computing things from there, and that's sort of like the local operation. Then you would like to find something that is better than that, something that doesn't require us to do some local manipulations, changes, changes of variables, but instead does things globally. And something that hopefully would allow us to do computations in a better way. I wanted to mention this because later on it would be useful in making actual computations. So the other strategy for, um, so instead of compactifying What you can do is to consider this vibration. Okay, so we'll blow up with, uh, with, in a sense, write out the, this n minus three dimensional space as in, as a fiber over n minus three one dimensional spaces. And the way this works is that you consider the forgetting map from your original space, M O N, and then you forget about the last puncture. <coughs> okay, so that's a map, and it defines a fiber bubble whose base space is M O N minus one. And this fiber is just the, the space on which the function that you forgot lives. Okay? So 
So this is going to be just Z, CP1 minus 1, minus, sorry, CP1 minus all the functors that are fixed from the pers perspective of Zn. So how this looks in pictures is that now we draw this original space as M1 minus 1. Okay. So that is dimension N minus 3. This is dimension N minus 4. And that's a similar space. But now over each point here, there's an attached sphere. Okay, and that's a sphere on which Zn lives. And we remove all the other ones of the Zn as well. So at this stage, you can ask, well, how about I just keep doing this and apply this forgetful map on and on and on. So there will be some MOPT here, and then you hit M3. So M3 is just a single point. So you might as well just stop there. And then each guy here would be its own CP1 with fewer and fewer functions removed. So that's a sphere on which Zn minus 1 lives, and it has these things removed. So for the, for the beef, beef guy, we have Cp1 minus Z1, Z2, up to Z, P minus 1. And how this looks like as a cartoon is that you have a sphere on which Z for this, I'm going to say for the purposes of this thing that it just fits z1, 2, and 3 to finite positions because then the label is easier. Okay, so we have z4, which just sees the fixed factors. Over each point here, there is a sphere associated with z5. Okay, so it sees the ones before and four, and so on and so on. And then we keep the sphere for the Zn. And this one is only the third one. Very good. So now you can ask well, can we repeat everything that we've said so far, but on these five places? So you see, the advantage of that is that well, the only singularities are these points. So there's no other, there's no blah blah, not none of that. It's just spheres with points. So to do computations, you need to understand how, how to actually glue them together. Okay. So let me let me take first P of them and call this MOP. And this MOP is sort of like a space like this. And what you want to understand how on this MOP there's some type of things, and we want to understand its fundamental group. But what happens if we start moving some factors around each other, how it affects the domain of fibers? Okay. And it turns out this can be described in exactly the same language. So we'll introduce some potential. <coughs> Labels which, which model space you have. And it looks like as follows. It's very similar to the ones we've seen before, but now you have a double sum from 1 to P, only the factor that actually live on this model space. And you also have this log of Zi on Zj. <coughs> and now the difference is that you no longer have, there used to be some kinematic invariance here. We no longer have that, we have some generalizations of kinematic invariance, and these are matrices. So you can show that this is n minus 3, n minus 3 matrix, and the 
this, you can think of it as generalizing. Generalizing kinematic environments that we have before. Okay, so likewise, this is a matrix uh, value function. And it defines a new connection, which as before, we have d plus d down below of d. But now this is matrix value. So let me, let me underline it. And that means, for example, that we can that we can put some non-trivial constraints on the integrability of, of this connection. So the integrability constraint means that this nabla of the on the W squares to zero. show that this constraint, what, it, what this implies for the coefficients in this matrix. And these, these <coughs> constraints are certain linearized uh, and vector relations. And they are as follows. So for each matrix, I J. If I, J, K, and L are all distinct, then they commute. So that tells you that the braiding of two faraway functions doesn't affect each other. And similarly, there's a second constraint, and these are the only two. That is this n back story. So we have ij, and commutator of that, so ik plus kj is zero. So you can show these things are not quite enough. So this puts some constraints on these matrices. They're not quite enough to to uh, to determine them completely, but now we understand that uh, we can find those matrices nevertheless. We can check these are these these relations, uh, and in the next lecture I will describe how are they useful for actual computations. Are automatically the, uh, they're automatically satisfied by the by the SIJ. Oh yes. So uh, let me consider a special case M O N. So P is equal to N. Yeah. This means it's a one by one matrix, and then it's a fact of life that every one by one matrix commutes. These matrices actually have an interesting structure that its eigenvalues correspond to one of its kinematic environments, which is kind of surprising. That's what I was asking. Is that, yeah. That, uh, so, yeah, so, so the eigenspectrum of each matrix is, consists, consists of, I actually don't know what, there's a physical proof of this, that the eigenvalues of this are always kinematic environments. So this is the way in which you can think of them as generalized kinematic invariants, which are normal matrices. You mean the eigenvalue subject that, that satisfied linearized chain vector equations? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? I mean, uh, you mean when you say kinematic invariants, you mean they're made out of like normal poles? Well, yes. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah. So everything is a kinematic invariant. Kinematic invariants. What do you mean exactly? That's oh yeah. Yeah. 
I should say in my course or something. Oh, good, fine. Okay. I just mean they're, they're like SIJs, right. they're, they're, SIJs. They're sums of, the, 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 the eigenvalues are sums of subsets of the momenta squared. Exactly, right. Yeah. So you, you or in terms of the SIJs, you just choose some subset of all the indices i into sum of all the SIJs in that sub yeah. subset. Yeah. This, of course, didn't have to be, so it's, it's, a, it's quite surprising. Yeah. Is that how you're going to see that, uh, I mean, well, maybe if you'll come to it, but, but uh, all the all the massive poles of all of these uh, amplitudes correspond exactly to those kinematic invariants being integers in general, right? Okay, yes. generally yeah, yeah. closer that's integrals. Yes. Yeah. Is that connected to the spec? Yeah, it is connected. In fact, that's, that's why I said that I don't know how to prove this directly, but there's a physical proof of this fact. And the proof is that later on, at some point, we'll have to invert matrices of this form. You will just have to invert this matrix. And then you can ask, well, when does the inverse not exist, meaning when, when is the resonance? And the resonance is exactly when one of those kinematic invariants Sorry, we'll have to convert things to this. Right. Because I'm integral k. Yeah. Yeah. And then all the poles will be have to be on the valid kinematic channels, otherwise it wouldn't make physical sense. Right. And that's how you see that the eigenvalues have to be there in the first place. But otherwise we have recursion relations for these objects. So phi, sorry. Omega of p is entirely determined in terms of omega of p minus one, and that is so that you can apply it recursively. So we have explicit uh, um, realizations of this of these matrices, and then you can try to prove from that recursion relation that these these beings are satisfied, although it looks complicated. So if you take a minor. Are the poles compatible, the, the ones that show up in a given minor? Compatible <coughs> with anybody? You take a minor of this matrix? Yeah. And you want to ask what? Well, there's a, you said all the eigenvalues are uh, just kinematic poles. Yes. And then uh, this minor will be some product of those. So those don't make, do those make sense as a graph? Or? I don't know. We can try to. Any other questions? Okay, then let's uh, try to be back here a little after around around three.